What do you think? Inspiring? Motivating? Intriguing? Did you get the message behind all that? Kind of hard, hard to miss, isn't it? What did you uh, think about what you heard? Do you agree with it? You know, that array of clips from cartoons and movies, music, motivational speakers, all reiterated a familiar theme in our culture, a message that comes across in all kinds of forms, like the ones we heard here. The way to unlock your true potential is to follow your heart, because your heart knows the way. If you feel it's right, follow that feeling. Because you can't lose if you follow your heart. Your heart already knows what you want. You're sure to do impossible, even magical things, if you follow your heart. This one I had to really kind of ponder. The answers you're looking for, everything you need, is already on the inside of you. Just follow your heart. And then like the song said, if you want to be free, to see the light in the dark, you got to follow your heart. You know, all that sounds so encouraging, so uplifting, but if you're like me as you listen to that, was there something a bit unsettling about it, something that made you say it's not quite that easy? As good as that sounds, there's something not quite right about it. I think, well, what could be wrong with encouraging someone to be true to yourself? Do what makes you happy. Do what you feel is right. Determine what's best for yourself. Chase your own passions and desires because that's the only path to satisfaction and fulfillment right do you notice the common thread in all those sentiments how self-centered and self-serving they are your happiness your feelings your passions you know from childhood we're conditioned to embrace this disney theology this hallmark worldview that says to follow your heart, and it sounds so good, it sounds right, it sounds so self-affirming, it even sounds vaguely spiritual, maybe even a bit biblical. The only problem, however, is you won't find anything remotely close to that in God's Word. What you will find are things like it says in Numbers 15, 39, when it says, remember all the commands of the Lord that you may obey them and not prostitute yourselves by chasing after the lusts of your own heart and eyes. So at the risk of bursting your bubble tonight, I gotta give it to you straight. Jesus never tells us to follow anything within ourselves. Now he said a lot about following, what to follow and what not to follow, but he never told us to follow our hearts. Instead, he tells us to follow him. And if you're going to do that, it says in Luke chapter 9, 23, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Other translations talk about denying yourself. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound nearly as nice, nearly as encouraging or affirming as following your heart. In fact, the call to deny yourself sounds uh, kind of harsh, maybe even a bit painful. But it comes down to the same principle that a lot of other biblical paradoxes in which God's ways are clearly at odds with our ways. In fact, God's ways often seem upside down and backwards compared to the way we think. According to Jesus, we gain by losing. We live by dying. We lead by serving. Scripture says that in weakness we find strength and brokenness can bring wholeness. So while it may seem counterintuitive to question or even resist certain feelings and desires within ourselves, God's word says that the way to true fulfillment is not to follow our own inclinations, but instead to turn from our own ways and surrender to the one who knows exactly what we need. Now that's the opposite of the world's wisdom, which says follow your heart because it knows the way. And yet the Bible tells us twice in the book of Proverbs where our own way is going to lead us. In fact, Proverbs 14, 12 and 16, 25 both say there is a way that appears to be right to us. But in the end, it leads to what? To death. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a good outcome to me. But that's where my heart will lead me if left to itself. In fact, if you go to Jeremiah 17, 9, you're going to see right there in black and white what God says about the condition of our heart and why we can never trust it. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things 
and beyond cure. Who can understand it? The New Living Translation says it like this. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Now, does that sound like something that we should follow without question? Does that sound like something that has all the answers or can lead you to freedom and fulfillment? The Bible makes it clear that it'll do just the opposite. Your heart will deceive you. It will fool you. It will let you down and lead you astray. And because no one can understand the heart, you won't even see the destruction coming most of the time. Because too often it comes in a very innocuous and a very appealing form. It's been like that since the very beginning. Adam and Eve were following their hearts when they defied God and ate the forbidden fruit. And as a result, sin entered into human existence, wreaking havoc on the world ever since. When people gathered on the plain of Shinar to build a tower, what we know as the Tower of Babel that would, that would reach the heavens, they were following their hearts. They were following their collective dream. And it wasn't that they couldn't accomplish something great, but God knew that they had no clue where their own aspirations would ultimately take them. So he confounded their language and their plans because he knew they were better off separated from one another than to join forces and follow their hearts to a swift and certain downfall. Abraham's nephew Lot learned that lesson the hard way when, when Abraham gave him the first choice of the land they were possessing and he followed his heart and settled in the most appealing place he could find and he ended up in Sodom which ended up compromising his entire family's morality and eventually he had to flee that city on the heels of annihilation and lost his wife in the process. A few weeks ago, we were looking at the judges and we saw a guy named Achan who listened to his heart and kept some of the spoils of the battle that God had, had forbid. And after all, he couldn't let it go to waste. And who was it going to hurt anyway? And yet from that one man's sin, we see that defeat coming on their entire army in the next battle with the tiny nation of Ai. And later on, throughout the judges, before Israel had a king, Judges 17, 6 says that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And as a result, they drifted repeatedly from God and encountered one disaster after another. I don't even have time to go into all the kings who went their own way and did their own thing with devastating consequences. Nearly every disaster that we see taking place in Scripture was a result of someone following their own heart. Because that's the root of all sin. Sin simply implies going our own way. And we know what the consequences of that are because Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin, again, is death. That way that we never see coming. And that hasn't changed. So when scripture tells us that the heart is beyond cure, it means that surrendering to Christ is not a matter of healing our heart or revitalizing somehow what's already there. Spiritual transformation in, involves a complete heart transplant. Ours for his. Because the only heart that we should be following is God's heart. Apart from him, there is nothing in ourselves that is trustworthy. Only when we're following God's heart, when we're driven by his desires, only then can we follow the heart within us. And when we do that, some extraordinary things can happen. Consider David, Israel's greatest king, writer of many of the Psalms. God himself described David in both the Old and New Testament as a man after my own heart because he will do everything I want him to. Now that doesn't mean that David was perfect. He had some huge failures. But David had a heart for God and desires that mirrored the Lord's desires. And God used him in a mighty way from the time he was a youth when, when uh, he subdued wild animals that tried to ravage his sheep. And then with the same vigor, he took out Goliath when the giant defied God's armies. And eventually, God made him king, even though David never sought that honor for himself. And David had a friend named Jonathan, uh, son of King Saul. And he had a similar heart for God because in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 14, we see an account of Israel's armies and they were void of weapons. You couldn't find a sword in the whole army. But when they were faced with superior enemies, Jonathan told his armor bearer this. He said, let us go over to the enemy outposts and let them see us. Now, that's a good strategy when you don't have any weapons. Go over and let them see us. And if they call to us to come down, we know God has given us the victory because, and listen to this statement of faith, because nothing can hinder God from saving, whether by many or by few. 
And then hear what his armor bearer said to Jonathan in 1 Samuel 14, 7. He says, do all that is in your heart. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. And there we see two young men who had their hearts set on God. And when they approached that enemy outpost, just the two of them, God uh, took the enemy by surprise and sent them into confusion. And they didn't even need a sword because their foes turned their weapons on themselves. And God gave the two of them a great victory that day. Last week, Pastor August talked about uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the boys from Babylon who followed God's heart into the heart of a fiery furnace where the Lord himself met them and spared them from harm. And Stephen, who followed God's heart to the point of death. Completely different outcome, but Jesus was there as well, waiting to welcome Stephen into glory. And Jesus is always there for those who follow God's heart. Now, it may not always appear that way in this life that things work out for the best when we're following God's heart, but the Bible clearly tells us that in the scope of eternity, the world's wide road ultimately leads to defeat and death. Well, God's seemingly narrow and often difficult path leads to victory and life. But experiencing that life requires that heart transplant. Because when God talks about bringing people in, you know, back into right relationship with himself, he speaks in terms like those he gave to the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 36, 26, when he said, I will give you a new heart and put in you a new spirit. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's the kind of transplant that we're talking about. In fact, the Bible talks about everything within us needing to be made new. Our heart, our mind, our spirit. And in, in practical terms, when we're talking about our heart, we're talking about you know, our thoughts and emotions, our inclinations and desires. I, I saw something today that said, follow your heart, but take your brain with you. But I'm here to tell you, you can't trust either one of them your heart or your mind, because it all needs to be transformed and renewed. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. And that includes all those humanistic ways of thinking and all that stuff we heard at the beginning about following your heart. Don't conform to that, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because then you will be able to test and approve what is God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. But if we embrace all that self-affirming message that the culture tries to give us, we're going to miss the perfect purpose that God created us for. Galatians 5, 16 and 17 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh craves what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit contrary to the flesh. They are opposed to each other, so you do not do what you want. And that tendency is always there. Even when we're following God's heart, we need to be careful not to be distracted by our own desires, our own inclinations, because even when something on the inside of us, that little voice that tries in some small way to, to remind us of God's standard and, and warn us when we're about to breach it, that thing we call our conscience, even when our conscience tries to keep us within God's guardrails, we cannot completely trust it because we defied that conscience enough times that we, can't, we can become desensitized to it. And even when we do listen to our conscience, it's not the final authority because Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 4, 4, my conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. And as a follower of Christ, we need to come to terms with these facts about ourselves on our own inclinations. First of all, your experience is not the measure of truth. That's what the world's trying to tell us. Oh, this is your truth. This is my truth. Everybody's got their own truth. That's not the measure. God's word is the measure of truth. We'll look at that before we close. Secondly, your conscience is not the measure of what's right. We're not left to figure it out for ourselves because there's only one standard that doesn't shift, and that's the character of God. And third, your feelings are not the measure of what's best for you. No matter how right something feels, only God's plan, the one who created you, can determine what you were made to do. It all comes down to what's right by God's standard, not ours. And it's not about what we think is best, it's what God knows is best. It's not about what our heart desires, but what his heart desires. Now, there is a place in the Bible that does say that God will give us the desires of our heart. 
But there's a caveat to that passage because uh, the desires don't originate from us. Those desires need to come from God and he will give us the right desires as we surrender control of our lives to him and set our affections on him. And that passage is found in Psalm 37, chapter, verse four. It says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now notice he's not saying that he'll just give you whatever your heart desires. Instead, God will grant your desires when they completely align with his desires. But that can't happen until you turn from your own way and surrender to Christ. And then God replaces your selfish and worldly desires with his desires. In other words, when it says that God will give the desires of your heart, it's saying that God will literally give you new desires. And then he will turn around and fulfill those desires as you set your mind and affections on him. The bottom line is this. Only when you have God's heart will he give you the desires of your heart. Only when your desires mirror those of Jesus and your life and character become patterned after his, then you can follow the heart within you and God will give you his deepest desires. Now, there is a sense in which God uh, may give people the desires of their own heart, or I should say he lets them uh, follow their heart, and if that's uh, when it takes them to the end of themselves and they realize their need for Christ. Sometimes God lets us have what we think we want, and he uses that as a means of correction and sometimes even judgment, but it's in God's mercy that he lets us experience sometimes the consequences of our choices. So we can come to our senses and realize my way can't cut it, and I need Jesus. Now taking that long and sometimes painful way around is typically not the course God intends for us, but finding and fulfilling the path and purpose he wants comes down to a matter of trust. Will you trust yourself or will you trust God? Will you follow your heart or his heart? The culture says follow your heart, but if that was enough, we wouldn't need to trust God. And you know Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you what path to take. Because our feelings, our emotions, our desires, even what seems to be rational thinking to us may tell us what we want to hear and sometimes might uh, take us where we think we want to go. But at the end of the road, people who trusted in themselves and fell for the world's lies are going to end up in places they never expected. A few weeks ago, Pastor Jeff preached a, a firm but gracious message on sin. I think it was the best message that, that I've ever heard him preach. And he said, one thing uh, that, that he talked about sin, he said, with sin we get what we want but we don't want what we get. As the scripture told us, even those ways that seem right to us are gonna to lead to death. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin. That's what we've earned for going our own way. So as inspiring and affirming as it all sounds to follow your heart, doing that will take you down a path away from God and out of his perfect plan for your life. And here's why following your own heart is so spiritually detrimental and, and ultimately disastrous. Just kind of to sum up with a few things. First of all, following your heart undermines the need to trust in God. If we had it all within ourselves, like the motivational speaker had, we wouldn't need God. Secondly, following your heart separates you from God and his purposes because they're going in two different directions. Following your heart will ultimately lead to dissatisfaction and destruction. We can just look around at the people who think they found everything they want in this world. They're still not satisfied because following your own heart will fool and fail you every time. Now, all that doesn't mean that God hasn't put certain desires inside you. Doesn't mean that he hasn't created you with specific uh, gifts and inclinations that he wants you to develop and use for his honor. But only when those things are surrendered to Christ and dedicated to his service is he going to uh, allow us to be and do what he desires. Only then will we fulfill all he's created us to accomplish for his glory. Again, the bottom line is this. The only time you can trust your heart is when your heart trusts fully and completely in God. Because as followers of Christ, the only heart we are to follow is his. In other words, we can follow our hearts only when our hearts are aligned with his heart and his desires become our desires. So how do you know that uh, your will 
that your desires, your plans, intentions, purposes are really surrendered to his? How do we know that, that our heart has been replaced by his heart? And how do we know that we're continually following his and not ours? Well, there's not a, a real easy answer. It's fairly simple, but it's a daily process that comes down to the most practical disciplines of discipleship. And discipleship, it simply implies following and learning from Jesus and taking on his character. And the only way that's going to happen is when we spend time in prayer and God's word. Because that's how he's chosen to relate to us. That's how he's chosen to reveal himself to us. And that's how we get to know Jesus, who he is, what he wants for us. We'll never get to know God's ways, his desires, or his heart apart from time and prayer and his word. And then responding to that word with action and obedience. Pastor Weaver has emphasized this repeatedly, how true biblical faith is more than believing. It's active. Faith implies trusting and obeying. That's what it means to walk by faith. And our guide for that has to be God's word because in order to grow spiritually, we need to filter all of our desires, all of our intentions, all of our actions and plans and purposes through God's word to ensure that our character and conduct align with God's purposes. And I know a lot of times it seems that everything we say comes back to those two disciplines of prayer and God's word. As if that's the answer for everything. Because in a big way, it really is. Because the only way we're going to gain God's heart is by listening to him in prayer and putting his word into practice. There's no substitute for those two disciplines if you want to develop Christ's character, recognize his voice, and follow his purposes and gain his heart. To help with that, I've placed out tonight some Bible reading guides. Now you can find things like this almost anywhere. I've kind of put these together in a little bit of a different way and there's two different ones and I'm going to encourage you to take one with you tonight. The beginning of a, of a new year is a great time to start this. One of them is a two-year plan and this is the first year of it and that will take you through the Old Testament one time entirely in, in chronological sequence. So you'll see it and it'll be a little bit different. It's generally the way things happen rather than just the sequence that's in there. So it's a little bit of an interesting way to go about it. It'll take you through the New Testament once in this time and there's some Psalms and Proverbs every day. And that's a little more lengthy one. Got a little more there. If you want something maybe a little more manageable, there's one that will simply take you through the New Testament along with a bit of Psalms and Proverbs each day. And on the back of that, there's kind of a guide with some things to keep in mind of how to approach Scripture when you're studying. And I want to encourage you tonight to choose one of those and take one and begin that through the course. There's no dates or anything, so you can start it and end it whenever at your own pace. But make it a point to get into God's word so you really start to get a grasp of his heart, who he is, and what he intends for you. Because when that happens, uh, transformative things can take place in our lives. So that's that discipline. Uh, tonight, before we close, I want to take some time just to practice and exercise the other discipline of prayer. But before we do, and as Pastor Brett comes and just begins to, to play something on the piano, I first of all want to give opportunity if there's anyone here tonight who recognizes within themselves that, yeah, your own way, your own heart, your own thinking hasn't cut it. And you can acknowledge, yeah, I've been going that way, and that's simply what sin is. And that's obviously not the same as a perfect God's ways. And you're saying, I'm ready to turn from those. I want to give control of my life to one who created it. I know that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that. He died in my place and rose again with the power and authority to give me a new life. And tonight, you want to start that process. You want him to come in and transform your life from the inside out and give you that new heart so you can be whoever he wants to be. I want with the, the rest of you with heads bowed and, and eyes closed. If that's you to, tonight, and you're wanting to make that decision to surrender. That's the first stage in all this, to surrender your life to Christ. I want to pray with you. I'm not going to sing you out or necessarily ask you to repeat anything. I'm going to pray for you, and you can pray just to, in your heart along with me. And God will come in and transform your heart and life. So with heads bowed, I'm just going to look around once, and I want to catch. If that's you, just look up and catch my eye. I want to know who I'm praying for tonight as we close. Is there anybody who wants to pray that? Okay, yes. Anyone else? All right. I see two or three. I'm going to pray with you right now. Just in your own heart, be praying like this. Lord, I thank you for these who are acknowledging tonight they've gone their own way and sinned against you. Jesus, they're asking you to forgive them 
and cleanse their life to make them new, to forgive them like your word says you're faithful and just to do if we confess. Lord, we thank you for that forgiveness and new life. They believe, Jesus, you are the Son of God who died in their place and rose again. You've got the power and authority to give them a brand new life, to transplant that heart. And tonight you're doing that. You're making them a child of God. Lord, I pray that you would put within them a heart of, of faith and boldness, that they'd be willing and able to confess you to others. And God, from now on, you would start taking them in the direction you created them to go. Lord, we thank you for that new life and purpose. We give you glory for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. If you prayed with me at that time, catch me or one of the pastors afterwards and, and let us know. It's, it's important to tell somebody. Find a place like this church at tie in. We'd love to have you here. Become part of things and we'll kind of help you uh, start to get on your way because God wants to take you in a, in a new and wonderful direction. The rest of us tonight, I want to just spend a few moments before we close and, and just uh, spend some time asking God to do these particular things because I think finding God's heart kind of falls into these uh, three categories. It's about God searching and about us surrendering. That has to happen first. So just to take some time tonight to ask God to search your heart and reveal anything that shouldn't be there and to repent of those things. That means a turn from, turn away from his ways and ask God to replace those things with his desires. And then ask him to help you to die to self on that daily basis and to choose his ways over your own. The second thing following his heart is about passions and priorities. When people talk about following your heart, that's usually what they're talking about. Ask God to give you his heart, to love the things he loves, to pursue the things he's pursuing. Ask him to help you grasp what it means to pray continually, to learn to talk to him, to be in, in, in contact with him all the time, just like a friend. Not just speaking, but listening. And to feed on his word. And pray for an intense desire for holiness. That means being set apart for his purposes. Don't look how close you can get to the world's edge. How close can we get to God? And he would prepare you for those purposes. And finally, it's about trust and obedience. Putting that word into practice. Ask the Holy Spirit for the desire and discipline to follow his ways over yours. To help you respond to his word. Every time that, that you hear it or receive it, get into it for yourself. Hear a message with bold and active faith. And ask God to give you a passion to reach a spiritually lost because that's his heart. That's what he wants us, the business he wants us to be about. So tonight, I want to encourage you just before we leave, we've got some time and find a place. It may be sitting where you're at. You know that I like to walk around when I pray. I think some of you get in that. You might kind of like that. I always encourage people to come down to this altar because that represents a place of encounter with God. Say, God, here I am. I'm laying myself out. I want your newness in every, every part of me. So tonight is, as we close, would you just find that place somewhere uh, in this room and let's just spend a few moments and use this as your guide. You can go through it. It won't take long and let God search you. Let him replace those passions and priorities and then ask him to help you trust and obey wherever he leads you. Let's just spend some time doing that tonight. Grab one of the guides that are on the tables as you go out there as well. Look at what one you're choosing, whether you want the New Testament or the two-year plan and to take one of those with you begin on it and God is going to just renew you like never before in 2021. Would you find that place tonight as we close? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. done with you pray that this heart is so evident that people can notice it notice it in you they may not know what it what it is that's different they may have no clue about God but they need to see something that's beyond just us like Austin said you're more than just you're another good guy or good gal at work they need to see something that just strikes them so curiously they want to know what it is about you that they see something in us that's different because our own heart's not even not going to cut it in that ways either and pray for us as a church, that we are a church with God's heart. The relational DNA that, that we talk about. Being a church is not afraid to preach the word uncompromised. All those things. Let, let people be able to come into this place and see a heart that's different. 
But sometimes that's kind of a litmus test. You're going about your way to see if this is really happening. Would somebody notice a difference in your heart? Would somebody know that there's something unusual, something about you that, that, they, they, that they need? Pray for your heart to be that evident to people that they would see God in us.